Good afternoon. And, uh, welcome to the Optical Sciences uh, Thursday afternoon colloquium series. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Salim Unlu from um, the College of Engineering at Boston University. Salim um, has a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urban and Champaign. He has been uh, teaching at Boston University for many years, since uh, the 1990s, I guess, 92. He, received, um, he has received many awards, for example, the NSF um, Career Award, the Young Investigator Award from the ONR. He has uh, a few distinguished uh, lecture awards and very well known for his work in um, biophotonics. So please welcome Professor Onlu. I actually have a very boring career. I did six years master's and PhD in Illinois, then I went to BU in 1992. For the last 25 years, it rolls off the tongue, right? 25 years. Many of you may not be 25 years old yet, so. <laughs> So I've been at BU for 25 years, and I worked on a variety of different topics. And this is um, our uh, attempt in uh, working in a, in a field which crosses over boundaries from uh, physics to semiconductors to um, optical imaging and to biological applications. And hopefully, I'll be able to convince you that it's an interesting field and it has uh, actual real life applications could benefit the uh, society in the long run. So all of my degrees are in electrical engineering. The only degrees I have in the other areas is the professor of. So I have no formal training in any other fields except for electrical engineering and I try to see everything from the electrical engineering perspective. In, a, uh, in electrical engineering, you learn a lot about waves, right? You solve Maxwell's equations. You uh, deal with things like interference. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to convince you that the uh, topics we're talking about, by applying a whole bunch of optical engineering bag of tricks, allows us to start with a very simple concept as what you see on soap bubbles every day, if you're lucky that you have soap bubbles all around you all the time, um, or oil slicks if you're not so lucky. Um, <clears throat> and, and then apply that to seeing and characterizing individual nanoparticles, and then applying that to a variety of different detection applications. So during my presentation today, I will violate causality a couple of times. And I'll warn you uh, once in a while that I'm violating causality. And this is my motivation in retrospect. <laughs> right? So we've been working on this field. Uh, you know, it was just random motivations, like because one of the students that I had in my lab didn't want to do anything but this. And that's how I got into biosensors. And he refused to work on anything else. And he'd rather be a teaching assistant and attempt something brand new in my lab um, than you know, taking a job, a paid job, as a research assistant working on an existing project. So, but later on, um, in 2011, we went to Nicaragua with a bunch of uh, undergraduate students from the College of Engineering in an attempt to show them how healthcare uh, is delivered or not delivered. Um, in the third world, and you know, I, I'm very proud of this picture because I was holding this baby. I love babies, um, and and she uh, was a daughter of a family living in a shanty town, built on a garbage dump, and they had water from a spigot, you know, one faucet that multiple families are sharing, and uh, their turn was like 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So. They, that's the only time they had water, but they had pictures in their uh, room where the background was Disneyland, right? So we, we kind of ruined the world by imposing onto them our 
uh, you know, wishes um, or the, the fancy things like they all have iPhones but not clean water. Anyway, so uh, it was interesting uh, trip for me also, although I'm from so quasi third world from Turkey originally, uh, but. I have seen firsthand poverty and how uh, health care is not available to people. And this is what there looks like a dirty kitchen. is actually a private lab across the state hospital. If you have money, you can get your blood tested in this facility because they didn't have such a facility in the uh, state hospital in the capital. Um, and I also learned that they had only one or two PCR machines at the time in the whole country, this polymerase chain reaction, and dengue's uh, epidemic was very serious, so you had to have your samples shipped across the country with the hope of being diagnosed. And it's important to be diagnosed so you can get the proper treatment. So oftentimes, the best medical technology will be available eventually in the low resource settings, but it will take many years for the technology to be cheaper. What I would like to argue is that you can come up with technology which is as good or better than the state of the art, and it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be complex. It can be inexpensive to begin with. So this is my altruistic motivation with some causality violation because, you know, I, you know, once I start working on it, I said, oh, okay, you know, we can actually do this for cheap. I'm coming from Boston University. Unlike University of Arizona, we don't have a, a good basketball team or a football team. And we're not a campus. We are an urban university. This is Commonwealth Avenue. And Boston University is kind of like a one-dimensional university. It goes from Somewhere here, Kenworth Square, where Fenway Park is. You probably heard about Red Sox. Uh, and it goes about two miles across the uh, city and kind of narrow because there is Mass Pike. Uh, Highway 90 goes from Boston to Seattle. And Photonic Center is right next to Highway 90. And there is commuter rail here, there's a bridge, and there's a. Uh, um, the subway system. And in this environment, you would expect that it would be extremely highly vibration sensitive, right? But luckily, the whole city of Boston is landfill. So it's basically, you know, soft uh, ground. And this is a big boat. It's not anchored to anything. It just sits in on the uh, landfill with, uh, you know, big anchors to stabilize it. And we've measured the, uh, the vibrations in the basement of the photonic center. It's pretty good. So with that introduction, I should also tell you that in the photonics area, we are pretty good. Maybe not as good as Optical Sciences Center, but we're one of the uh, um, uh, successful uh, research laboratories. And we are also very keen on life sciences. And more recently, we have made a huge attempt in specifically infectious diseases. And there is a um, National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, this building, um, built at Boston University campus, in the medical campus. Um, and that's a biosafety level four facility aimed at studying the most nasty uh, pathogens, except for smallpox, like Ebola, among other things. Um, we're yet to get this fully certified. We've been waiting for about six years. And I, part of the reason is I think the, the acronym they chose, they thought it was very clever to come up with National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory, needle. Nothing scares people more than a needle. So, and then the community has been up in arms against uh, Boston University, you know, stopping this uh, facility from being functional. So today I'm going to talk about optical interference, give you a little bit of an overview of what we think we are accomplishing. And then I'll talk about the ensemble measurements, the genesis of the idea of interferometric detection, and focus mostly on single particle detection and characterization. So the, to continue with the motivation, the most common method for diagnostics or molecular sensing 
to indicate infections or um, different diseases is so-called ELISA, or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. It's a sandwich assay. What that means is you capture the target protein or something uh, else in the blood or other bodily fluids, um, and then you cannot see signal from capturing this uh, protein or uh, other marker, and you decorate with a secondary marker, which is linked with an enzyme or another transduction mechanism, such as a fluorescent molecule, which provides sufficient signal so you can start seeing the presence of the targets. This also provides increased specificity because both of these events must occur at the same time. So the chance of that happening uh, non-specifically is reduced because it's going to be a multiplic multiplicative uh, factor. And this has been extremely successful. And today, when you get a blood test, oftentimes ELISA will be used. And it's done in large machines, in facilities, and the cost is reduced because you're studying many, many samples in, a, in an instrument. And actually, when you buy ELISA experiments or exp ELISA tests from uh, a, a manufacturer like Abbott, they give you the machine. Right? This is like a $300,000 or half a million dollar machine, but that's rented to you for free as long as you buy all the tests from them. And the test costs about 3 to $10 each, and you have to promise at least 100,000 tests. So you can start doing the math. Right? You know, you end up paying a million dollars back. So it's been an interesting uh, idea to do this detection of the target molecules without secondary labels, or effectively so-called label-free. And surface plasma resonance has been um, the uh, gold standard, no pun intended, because it uses a gold surface, um, of commercial success. And Biacor is a company um, that commercialized this technology, and that is basically benefiting from the optical properties of this thin film and total internal reflection at this interface, coupling into surface plasma resonances, and that being very sensitive to dielectric changes in the solution above or on the surface. So this has been very useful in studying dynamic of binding on the surface and kinetics of molecular binding, but not necessarily very successful in diagnostics or detection because it has a sensitivity limitations. When you think about infectious diseases, the most successful method is so-called polymerase chain reaction, or uh, PCR. It's basically using a, a natural phenomenon of DNA replication using polymerase. And it can now amplify the same sequence very specifically. Each step of amplification is going to well, let's say double it, so then, you know, after 30 steps, you can imagine 2 to the 30 is about a billion, right? So you can amplify the, from one molecule to a billion molecules, and now you have many, many copies, uh, so you can generate a detectable signal. PCR also takes a huge amount of infrastructure. My uh, uh, medical collaborators have shown me pictures of a uh, truckload of hardware that needs to be shipped to Africa if you wanted to establish a PCR lab to do the testing, uh, for example, in case of an Ebola epidemic. There has been an effort in trying to de de detect single particles. And there has been many methods. Um, there are two intuitive and common methods. One is, I don't have enough signal from the molecule or small pathogen like a virus without labels. So I can increase the local field or effectively interact with the same particle multiple times in a resonator. So I can increase the signal. Or alternatively, I can reduce the volume. Um, in case of these, uh, this technology or in digital PCR, what they do is they reduce the volume, so there's only one event in each volume, but the background is really low, so you can do a detection after amplifying the signal inside. 
So you still amplify the signal, but you do have uh, the capability of doing basically single molecule detection. <coughs> and digital PCR also works that same way. You amplify very small volumes, and you get a large signal from each, but it is either zero or one. Okay? Our technology is doing neither, and I'll tell you how it works. So our interferometric reflecting imaging sensor and uh, a name uh, coined by one of my PhD students who's not working on this uh, project because we used to call it Spectral Reflectance Imaging Biosensor, SRIB. And the first paper uh, we published says that on the title. But then we had a, a long uh, collaboration with Italian group, uh, with an Italian group, and they said, we can't say CIRIB. So I had to come up with a better acronym. So we had a competition among my students, and one of them came up with IRIS. Although IRIS is such a common name, you know, there are, when you try to coin or, or uh, get the domain name iris.com, good luck, right? <laughs> you know, irisanything.com is no way. Um, so in this modality, in this uh, biosensor, ISIS. ISIS, we can have ISIS. <laughs> ISIS, we probably can't get it. <laughs> but that would be not very domain specific. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I like your sense of humor. <laughs> um, so in one modality, we can basically do a bias uh, mass measurement. So it's a label-free measurement, very much like SPR. It can measure amount of material bound onto the surface. Or alternatively, you can focus on a narrower field of view and count individual particles on that surface. So I call it, it's a very versatile technology because on the same exact chip, without making any modifications to the chip, actually part of the same experiment, you can have your capture probe spots and you can do quality control on it. I'll tell you why that is important in a few uh, minutes. So for example, in our um, experimental procedure, we always have a quality control step. We print the chips using a robotic spotter and verify that we have enough capture probes on a spot. And we also look at the, the variability across uh, the chip from spot to spot. And then you can also do dynamic measurements, monitoring binding on this if you're incubating with uh, a target solution. And it could be multiplex. You can have hundreds of different probes and you can look at uh, each spot behavior over time, depending on what targets you have. And this is showing um, a sandwich assay, for example, where you bound one molecule, say, in this case, uh, interleukin, uh, and then you're decorating with another protein. And also, you can do single particle counting and do that in real time. So this is showing individual viruses being captured under the surface, and we're seeing, visualizing, and counting them, and characterizing them at the same time in a large field of view. This is blown up to the corner of the spot. Otherwise, we can have as many as six uh, spots in the same field of view. And you can scan. The, the uh, time scale here is minutes. So you can scan a much larger area within a minute and then you know, get um, time domain measurements with tens of seconds or minute uh, time resolution. OK, so I'll tell you how it works. But, but I want to first establish that the way optical biosensors in general work is that you are benefiting from how light interacts with matter. And I can put it into two classifications. One is energy transfer, so you can absorb the energy from light and re-emit it, for example, in case of fluorescence. And that's very sensitive because you can filter out all of the excitation because excitation and emission are at different energy windows or different wavelengths, different colors. You can uh, illuminate with green and look at only the red, and that can be equivalent to looking at a light uh, a match lit in a dark room. So very, very easy. 
The alternative interaction is delay of light, retardation of light, basically refraction of uh, light when it passes from one medium to another. But the ability to detect a very small amount of material is difficult in this case. Except optical interference is extremely powerful. You look at a soap bubble, light reflects from the top and the bottom of the film, interferes itself, and you get beautiful colors because the thickness changes across and different wavelengths at a specific point either constructively or destructively interfere. So you get amplified reflection at some wavelengths and not so much other wavelengths. The thing is, you look at the soap bubble, you are doing a measurement without actually you know, thinking about it of about 10 nanometer precision, or even better, if you can tell apart colors uh, more uh, you know, uh, f uh, in finer steps. I mean, if you're colorblind, good luck. But you know, uh, among my PhD students, there were three American men who were all colorblind. So they won't be able to do this. But you can use instrumentation to read the colors. Or you can build a very large interferometric setup as uh, you know, we've had an opportunity here at the winter school. Uh, I've heard a talk uh, from one of the scientists work at LIGO project. And you can do a measurement which is very difficult to comprehend. 0 0.1 atometer displacement is very difficult to understand, right? So the size of the protein is about 10 nanometers. Now you go another factor of 1,000 to 10 picometers, another factor of 1,000 to 10 femtometers, then another 1,000 to 10 atometers, another 100. So it's like 10 to the 10 order of uh, difference, or uh, 10 to the 11 order between those two. So we don't have to do this much, but we can do better than this, let's say by a factor of 1,000 or 10,000, and that brings us into an interesting capability to do biosensing. So nothing is new when you think about uh, light and interference. Um, this is a paper I like very much. I referenced this multiple times. This is by George Airy. He wrote about how to explain Newton's rings. So that's dating it back another couple hundred years prior to this. And this is prior to having electromagnetic theory. So it's talking about things like um, vibration in the plane of reflection, so on and so forth. But the equations are identical to what equations we're using to you know, understand um, interference or wave phenomena. So we can't really functionalize a soap film, but you can make a perfect soap film by using the purest material known to mankind, and that's silicon. The reason it's the purest material, there's a huge trillions of dollars of uh, industry behind it, and, and the reason silicon is very successful in making integrated circuits is it has a... Um, high quality thermal oxide, native oxide that forms onto it. And basically you can have a silicon wafer heated to 1100 degrees C in the presence of oxygen, then it will form this glass layer on top of it which will be very flat and very uniform. And if you change the thickness of the glass by recessing it at different points, you get the same rainbow effect as you would see in a soap bubble. And this comes at a very small cost. It's 10 cents a centimeter square without trying you know, the very large volume. I mean, even we can get it at that uh, price the point. And then you can functionalize it. Then you can make it highly multiplex. You can have thousands of spots of different proteins on the same chip on a centimeter square, you can fit uh, tens of thousands of spots. And we were surprised that we were able to patent something like this. You know, people knew about this uh, 400 years ago, and uh, yet, for a biosensing application, we were able to write a patent. And uh, this is how it works. As opposed to looking at the color, which is uh, tasking, 
right? You wanted to do spectroscopic measurement under white light illumination uh, for each point, then on a, a large area, let's say you have to do 10 million spectroscopic measurements. Instead, we do an intensity measurement at different wavelengths on the entire chip. And this is enabled by the uh, readily available CMOS cameras uh, and optics for imaging. So you can image the reflection from the surface and get an intensity image at a wavelength, change the wavelength, get another intensity image. So for each pixel on the camera, you can get a intensity signature as a function of wavelength. Now, if there's anything bound to the surface, at that point, that signature will be shifted. And from that shift, you can actually do a picometer measurement very easily, right? So we sweep the wavelengths, and we can get a picometer resolution optical profile of the surface. So if there is a picometer of material, we can see it. Or we can do this at a few wavelengths. So very naively, when we approach this problem with David, we thought, OK, we need to have a tunable laser to cover this sinusoidal behavior so we can fit it very accurately. And we started to talk to other people. I said, well, you don't need. It's a very predictable shape, so you need only a few measurements. Actually, right now, we're using a single wavelength after we calibrate everything. Right? So you can get this with LEDs also. And at the result, you get a um, surface image of different proteins at different spots. And with David, we've started a company called Zoray. Ray of life. Um, it's a, actually, Zoe is life, as I understand, in Greek. And uh, this company wasn't very successful because we didn't have the significant advantage that is needed to make a, a, a commercially successful product displacing existing technologies. So what that technology could do, dynamic measurements, and measure uh, very many molecules simultaneously binding uh, in real time. And obviously, you know, I had a whole bunch of students working on these different aspects of it, and they got successful PhDs and went on to successful careers. So one of the important aspects of this technology is it's extremely quantitative. There are no fudge parameters. And we demonstrated this by using a very controlled robotic spotter. At the time, we didn't have such an instrument. So we worked with uh, Marcella Chiari in Milano. And she was able to spot known amounts of biomolecules onto our chips. Um, and we knew exactly how much mass there is. And then we looked at our uh, signal. And there was a very linear orders of magnitude correspondence on the signal. And from that, we could get the fitting parameters for different molecules. Since optical properties in the visible light of all proteins are very similar, they have the same ballpark fitting parameter. DNA is slightly different, and you get a different uh, parameter for DNA. But overall, you can actually do a very quantitative measurement and convert the measurement result to molecules per unit area. And this is very relevant because, as a quality control tool, because your assay results directly depend on the amount of capture molecules you have on your sensor. Because your sensor will have a different response for different amount of molecules on the surface. For example, this is a results from our lab on some uh, allergy molecule capture and fluorescence readout. You can see that unless we make the correction, the, the data is all over the place, with the uh, correction, with the measurement a priori uh, telling us how much we have on the surface to begin with, then we can make a very good fit. This is also another experimental result showing that the capture efficiency depends very much on the antibody density on the surface. So if you have a signal like this, for example, um, is, is it because you have more virus 
or is it because you have more capture probes? So it's very important to know where you are before you can start the experiment. And the quality of the spots can also vary. They're not necessarily all circular, and the distribution across them may be different from one another. Industry didn't have a solution for this because you couldn't see the spots and you print on glass. You can see them if you print on the iris substrate, but if you print on a glass slide, you can no longer see them because you don't have the benefit of the interference to make these thin layer of molecules visible. Instead, they would mix fluorescent molecules or measure at the end of their experiment and see, oh, experiment failed, right? So we benefited from this. You can't see the spots here because it's a single wavelength image and the spots are actually faint. For uh, image analysis, those are actually mountains, so you can easily see them. In an instrument that's simple, you could actually see this is a four millimeter by four millimeter area. You can image the uh, entire microarray and do quality control. And we're working with a German company called Sinion. Um, they're experts in uh, robotic spotting, fluid delivery onto surfaces. And we can be, uh, basically do the quality analysis of the spots at a large field of view or at individual spot layer. And we are now trying to develop actual the nomenclature or the, uh, the parameters that we can add to existing parameter space of microarrays. With that, I'm going to move on to single particle detection. And I think it's OK. If you have any questions, burning questions, you can ask me right now. Yes? What is your spot size on, on the microchip? Um, the spot size sizes are limited by the printing technology. The smallest spots you can actually make reproducibly are about 50 to 60 microns. It depends on how you can control the humidity in the chamber and how quickly these spots uh, evaporate. Because when you try to immobilize biological molecules on the surface, you have to wait a long time, typically overnight. You put a droplet include, you know, containing the micromolecules or molecules onto your surface and let it sit for a long time. So the molecules go find the surface and bind to the surface, and then you wash. All right? So it can be as big as three, 400 uh, microns in size also, each spot. Uh, I have a question. What is your scanning mechanism? Is it, do you scan or just? This is a wide field image. It's a, just a wide field microscope. If I needed to scan an entire microscope slide, I'll show you some results later on, um, then you just move the sample. It's, uh, we use a, a translation stage from Thor Labs. Well, your detection is just a CCD sensor? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a camera. There it is. It's a very ordinary camera. Since we are illuminating with lots of light, we don't need low light sensitivity or anything like that. It's not a cool camera. Um, for example, in the beginning of our research, we had only cool cameras because, you know, we did lots of spectroscopy work in our lab. And the first sets of cameras we installed on our instruments were old, you know, expensive, like $10,000 cool cameras. And they're now, now sitting on the shelf. If there's a buyer, I'll sell them. <laughs> you want one? Let's <laughs> <I should> try. <laughs> Is that silicon dioxide layer just uh, of the order of one wavelength, or if you make 100 it much nanometers? So if you make it much thicker, say two micron or three micron. Okay. Does that improve the sensitivity in any way? So the answer is no. Um, when we started these experiments, we started with five micron thick oxide because we used a tunable laser. I cut it all out of my presentation because I have other things to talk about. But with five micron thick oxide, we could use a tunable laser which had a narrow tuning range, like 50 nanometers at 780. Right? Because you needed to sweep a, a cycle um, within the tuning range of the uh, laser. Then we discovered that we can use visible light emitting diodes. They can go from 400 nanometers to 670 nanometers or so. They're all available 
at specific wavelengths because of the illumination industry. If you try to look for very high power LEDs, you will always find what's called grow lights. This is an experience that I had recently. I wanted more, more power to make our measurements faster and faster. And all I find is grow lights. You know what they're used for? OK. They're used for growing weed. <laughs> but the most powerful LEDs you can find on the internet are grow lights. Of course, they have other more benign applications. You can grow you know, beans, maybe. <laughs> but what would you have in a closed environment where you're not benefiting from the sunlight? Okay, <laughs> I think I have my answer. <laughs> so, and later on we figured out that we can actually do this at a single wavelength. And there is really no benefit of uh, using thicker layers. But on a different application where we were using fluorescence spectroscopy, we actually had a 17 micron thick oxide. That becomes difficult because it's a self-limiting process to grow 17.1 microns, then you have to penetrate through. You, your oxygen atoms molecules have to go all the way through 17 microns of oxide glass to reach the silicon surface. It takes 35 days in an 1100 degree C oven to grow 17 micron oxide. But somebody is willing to sell you wafers $100 a piece because they have an oven running. They can just shove it in there and then leave it there forever. So we bought wafers from 30 nanometers of oxide to 17 microns of oxide. This technology works best at thin oxide layers, 100 to 200 nanometers. OK? Single particle detection is something completely different, in which case we can detect the presence of individual viruses, or if we decorate them with small metallic labels, individual proteins and nucleic acids. Why is it important to do individual molecule detection or a digital detection? This shows from David Wall's paper, um, when you try to do an analog readout, you're trying to differentiate between the amount of signal here versus the amount of signal here, and that gives you a limitation of about picomolar sensitivity when you try to do um, analog readouts. When you do digital readouts, for each point you're making a 1-0 decision and it's much easier. And that 1-0 decision being easier and you're doing it thousands of times, in their application they have 240,000 microwells and they're doing 240,000 1-0 decisions, they can go down to fours of magnitude lower concentration in sensitivity. And this is the instrument their company built called SIMOA, Single Molecule Analysis Instrument. That's as big as a double door refrigerator. The analogy I have is the vinyl recording. You needed to have a great turntable to accurately, precisely transduce the recorded sound by running a stylus across the vinyl grooves where the information is coded as the height of the groove. If you don't have a very good record player, you do not reproduce the sound that is recorded onto the vinyl disc. So you have to invest most of your money on the record player. This is 60s, 70s. So unless you like that hissing sound on the background, like some of the old people in the audience, <laughs> so you wouldn't care about that, right? You can actually put... <laughs> Who's that? That's not you, right? <laughs> so you can actually put artificial hissing sound for those who are really interested in that into the digital recording. 1983, Sony came up with the compact displayer, and those are history. One of the limitations of a vinyl player is that you can take it anywhere you wanted to, unless you are Muhammad Ali. Um, and, you know, I have seen a record player in a car in the 17 when I was not born yet. No, I was, I was a small child. <laughs> Those existed, but now you can take it running. In the 80s, you could take it running because the transduction is so much simpler. 
Now that you're convinced that digital readout is a good thing, why can't we do that? Why can't we see individual pathogens, individual viruses? The answer is they're too small. When microscopy was invented 400 years ago, that's the first ever microscope, people could see cells, uh, bacteria, because they are actually larger than the wavelength of light. 400 years later, with the most sophisticated optical microscopes we have, we still have difficulty seeing individual viruses. Why is that? Um, this is a picture uh, from uh, Larry Ziegler uh, showing a surface enhanced Raman scattering sample with nanoparticles, 80 nanometer gold particles, and a bacterium. You can see the size difference, right? Those are actually really small. It rolls off the tongue saying that, oh, 10 micron versus, you know, 100 nanometers. But, you know, there's a size scale of another 100 or so. And the signature from a nanoparticle or a, a small, smaller than wavelength particle, unless you decorate them with fluorescent markers, is scattering. Right? You will see a increased or decreased uh, intensity coming back to your camera depending on the size of the particle. And the scattering scales with the volume of the particle, mass of the particle, effectively, and the index contrast with the medium. You do an intensity measurement in the far field that is squared. That goes by r to the 6. What that means is you reduce your size by a factor of 10, signal goes by a factor of million. So the signal is, let's say you're seeing something with 50% contrast, divide 50% by a million, that's the contrast you cannot see. So viruses, for example, blend into the background if you try to look at them on a glass slide. What can you do to increase their signature? Um, a, the method that's been used for the last 20 years, and uh, the, there's been significant advances in this field, you can increase the amount of light that interacts with the nanoparticles. You can use a photonic crystal, a toroid, or disk, and increase the amount of light interaction with the nanoparticle and get a larger signal. But that's not an imaging modality. To visualize the nanoparticles, all we have to do is put the soap bubble underneath. This is the silicon soap bubble. And all of a sudden, you have also light reflecting specularly from the surface. That forms your reference light. And instead of looking at only scattered light, now you have the interference term. It's a common path interferometric signal you get. And that scales with field. That means it depends R to the 3. So instead of reduced by a factor of million, it is reduced by a factor of 1,000 or it becomes 1,000 times brighter. Now, those can be readily visible. As long as you adjust the phase term between the two of them, and I'll get back to that, um, to make them visible. And that can be adjusted by selecting the oxide thickness properly for your given wavelength, for example, uh, for our experiments, for uh, typical viruses, 100 nanometers of oxide is ideal. And there is plenty of flexibility in that thickness. It doesn't have to be precise to that. It can be anywhere from 50 to 150, for example. So to demonstrate to you that this was a very simple thing to do, when I had the idea that we can actually see individual viruses on this simple surface when we were working on the ensemble measurements in imaging modality, the first generation of iris, I didn't have the manpower, so I asked these two undergraduate students in my electronics class, George and Rahul, and I said, yeah, I have a project for you, for your senior design project. Are you willing to do it? They said, we don't know any optics. I gave them the book. They read the first five chapters, and within eight months, they were able to reproduce Im produce images of 100 nanometer polystyrene spheres, so artificial samples, on a surface, this is a fluorescence image because they had fluorescence labels inside these uh, uh, spherical particles, and this is the iris image. 
and they are very easily detectable, and the size information being uniform, size being uniform, the signal is uniform. And this is um, a picture prepared by George uh, years later. Uh, actually, this was uh, published in 2016, demonstrating how it works uh, for exosome detection. Specifically, the nanoparticles in this case are exosomes. Um, and George has finished his PhD in 19, uh, 2013, and uh, he started a company with another uh, one of my students, and they have successfully commercialized this technology. And the idea is you shine light. If there is nothing bound, nanoparticles bound on the surface, you don't get anything. If there is a particle, you get a diffraction-limited spot. You're not getting a spot at the size of the particle, but the brightness of the diffraction-limited spot you see on your camera is proportional to the size of the particle. And this is a size and curve that you generate. When you change the size, it gets brighter. And you can have a multiplex chip, like that chip the, you, uh, we first designed. And you can see this is uh, actually 14 millimeters on a side. And you can functionalize this uh, two millimeter by two millimeter area with hundreds of different spots and measure individual binding events and characterize every one of them. OK, now I'm going to uh, talk about how we can actually do interferometry. Because interferometry actually means that you have phase information. You sweep one of the arms to get periodic oscillations. And that has a wealth of information. When you have a common path interferometric setup, you don't have the benefit of a separate arm that you can sweep. At least that's what we thought. But it turns out that your illumination field and scattered field have drastically different K components or angles. That means if you change your focus, you can change the phase between scattered field and the reference field. OK? And then you get this interferometric signal, which is you know, you have the focus uh, or defocus of the scattered light envelope. Within that envelope, you get this periodic signal. This is the other uh, violation of causality because we first realized that the contrast of the particles, depending on where the particles are in a single focus image, was changing dramatically. So we couldn't get it, the whole chip into focus. And focus is kind of ill-defined. You have this nanoparticle, let's say, if it's sitting in mid-air, you can define focus precisely. You put it on a surface, there's the surface, there's the reflectant, and there's an image of the nanoparticle. Where is the focus point? And depending on the thickness separation between us, the brightest point could be out of focus, for example. The brightest point is off-centered here, so you have to be a little bit out of focus. Or if you're out of focus in the other direction, it could be a negative uh, signal. So we recognize this, and we actually published this paper a week ago, um, that instead of looking at the profile, we can subtract the brightest point by getting a, a set of defocus images and from the darkest point, and then we get a difference image. And these difference images for all these nanoparticles map a very good, robust template. So you can do a template matching and automatically find all the nanoparticles on the surface. The reason we didn't discover this in the correct order, first do the theory and then apply it and then you know, get beautiful results, uh, Jake is a mechanical engineering student and he was in charge of uh, um, doing all the instrumentation and image analysis, and he had really not much idea of electromagnetic waves. Then later on, Ozan and Darren, BME and EC student, they said, well, this is how it works. And you know, we explained our, the phenomena we've observed and used. So I'm going to talk about virus detection. I wanted to add the, uh, put these uh, cartoons in first. Do you remember a few years back, there was a Ebola epidemic in Africa. And it was a huge panic in the United States, completely misplaced. And the fear has no reasoning. Right? 
Well, the Ebola people are coming. They're going to infect us. And the scientist or the CDC guy says, we can't contain the EDRC outbreak, right? Well, they're not a cartoon. You know, we're afraid of Ebola. Oh, my God, it's so scary. It killed three people in the United States. And they all were imported after they'd been infected overseas, as opposed to obesity killing 300,000 or tobacco killing you know, half a million people a year. Yet, big fear, Ebola. We can't study Ebola in our lab, so we started to work on hemorrhagic fever viruses, but pseudotypes. Those are harmless viruses. They are genetically modified to express the proteins of those nasty viruses like Ebola, Marburg, and Lassa fever. So chemically, they are indistinguishable from the harmful viruses. So you fabricate a chip with different capture probes, and you do a measurement before and after, before incubation, after incubation. These were all dry measurements. And then you filter out the noise, because that doesn't fit the description of a virus. And you can get pretty sensitive detection modality. Since we started the research a few years before the Ebola epidemic, we had some limelight. And our paper published in ACS Nano was picked up by someone like Bill Frist. And he wrote it up in uh, Forbes magazine. So it was a nice surprise. Since then, we've been working on a variety of different viruses. These uh, images are actually from my student's company, NanoView. And they demonstrated recently, this is not yet published, that they can do a large variety of different sizes of viruses. And Zika, again, you know, hype, right? Zika is an actual real threat for the United States, unlike Ebola, right? Because mosquitoes carry it. You don't have to kiss the dead body to get uh, Zika. You can be stung by a mosquito and you get Zika. Right? Um, and we have to always verify our measurements with a known methodology like uh, electron microscope. So this is showing that we have the ability to do size characterization of very many uh, viruses on a surface. This is um, thousands of viruses characterized on a large area. In, in case of vaccinia, it has a very large bimodal size distribution because this is known that vaccinia can be broken up into pieces and it could be uh, a whole bunch of fragments as opposed to whole viruses itself. And you can see those things. And you can see what percentage of the vaccinia is actually intact. All right. So nobody wants to blow dry an Ebola chip after you incubate it with a suspected infected you know, infected blood, right? So we were always uh, considering that. You know, we wrote in the proposal. We had no idea how we are going to do it. But we had to do this detection in liquid. So you can do it in a contained environment. The problem is when you surround the viruses in water, the refractive index contrast is significantly reduced. So you get weaker signal instead of, 7% uh, contrast, you get about 2% contrast. It's a factor of three penalty. But we did it through lots of engineering, you know, reducing the noise floor, improving the imaging system, so on and so forth. And we discovered that we were doing it wrong all along. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and we were able to do this in a cartridge in a flow-through system. Jake, uh, Steve is another mechanical engineering student. He just started the job last week. And this video you've seen before is showing that these individual viruses are captured as we flow the solution across this cartridge. Um, one at a time, you can count them. And this allowed us to do a very simple workflow. And we made some passive cartridges using a laminate process, using an external vendor. And in this case, you have the chip mounted in. It is already functionalized with different uh, capture probe molecules. Uh, we typically make a multiplex chip for Marburg, Lhasa, Ebola, and uh, a control spot for different antibodies in large uh, lab rep replicates. And you put the sample in. You close the cap, and 
by closing it, you push the liquid through the channel, so the prime the channel. It touches the absorbing pad, which is like a cotton paper. It starts wicking it. It pulls it. You're not pushing it. It's getting pulled. Have you ever uh, dipped a, a tissue into water that's spilled on the floor? So you'll see, you know, it will get wicked inside. Capillary flow. And you control when it starts slowing by removing this air seal. And then you count. For some reason, this movie is refusing to play. Well, anyway, you would have seen dots here and a number of particles counted in time. So that allowed us to have another factor of 100 improvement in our sensitivity because it was so much easier to distinguish a new event as opposed to comparing a number of events prior or at the end. So this paper just came out. Um, what we have done is we, Nanoview, under the NIH contract, we had delivered instrument to UTMB, and they run most of these experiments in spacesuits. These are actual Ebola samples from uh, cell cultures. And we did a comparison between our methodology in those disposable cartridges versus lateral flow of assays, and we are about two orders of magnitude better. And we also compared the PCR. We didn't drive the uh, concentration down to further levels, but so it was pretty good compared to the PCR. I think PCR had another one or two orders of magnitude room at the bottom. The added benefit is that in imaging modality, you also learn something about the particles. For example, Ebola is filamentous, and it can be very large. It can be microns long. Then you can see those things. And there is some correlation between the shape of the viruses and how infectious they are. So you can learn more. We don't know what it is useful for, but it's a new capability people didn't have before. I'm sure they'll come up with a, a use. And we've also studied exosomes. Exosomes are the, these extracellular vesicles. They are known to carry nucleic acids and RNA. And actually, I recently learned that polio is carried from one cell to another by disguising itself into exosomes. Right? So they, they've shown me some uh, transmission electron microscopy pictures showing a 200 nanometer exosome or, or extracellular vesicle with polio viruses inside. So they have a lot of uh, relevance in healthcare or diagnosis. And we're able to see them and characterize them and get a size distribution. And deliberately, this is called particle contrast, because we're not too confident about how that corresponds to sizes. Because these are dried exosomes. They lose some of the water. And they lose their shape. When you do an AFM measurement, they look like pancakes. They're only 10 nanometer height and in, uh, height uh, and uh, hundreds of nanometers in uh, width, potentially. But again, we had to verify our measurement with respect to AFM and SEM and so on and so forth, because people don't believe us. I submit to you that eventually people will be verifying SEM measurement with respect to what we can do on our system. OK. So this is why we were doing it wrong. We had a very naive idea that we do color illumination, and we fill the entire aperture of the back plane of the uh, objective, and we do a very uniform color illumination, and we look at the scattered light. And recently, we actually formulated all of those things and figured out how to optimize the nanoparticle visibility in this white field interferometric microscopy modality by you know, engineering the pupil function. For example, this is showing the visibility of nanoparticles if you change the illumination numerical aperture, how much you're filling the back aperture of the objective. So you can see if you have a narrow, uh, wave, a narrow angle illumination, you get higher con uh, contrast, and then it drops. 
this full NA, NA, NA illumination, we can't see the 50 nanometer particles at all because their contrast is about half a percent and our limit is about 1%. But if you reduce the illumination angle to 0.3 NA, then they have about 2.5% contrast. So we kind of knew this before, but this is like the first time we fully formulated it. Um, why not make it the 0 NA or 0 0.1 NA? Because the amount of light you can put onto your system also scales with NA square. If I try to limit the NA of the illumination light, it's going to be harder and harder to do the imaging because it will take a long time to enough take enough photons. So there is an optimization, and you can sacrifice a little bit of the contrast. I mean uh, the contrast, but you get sufficient photons. So this is the experimental results fitting the theory really well. Okay. Silicon reflects too much light. Why do we use silicon? It's readily available. It's a beautiful, perfect surface. But it does reflect a lot of light. So what is the handicap of that? If you have a larger reference light, you have smaller contrast. So we thought that we can also control the amount of reference light by building a uh, optical mask in the collection path. And we, uh, we built a 4F system. So you have a conjugate of this at this point. So you have whatever you have here, you have it also on this side, on this point. And there you can put an amplitude filter. So we made an amplitude filter with 1.3 OD or uh, 50 times reduction of the intensity going through the middle, which is where most of the reference light is, and the scattered light is at larger angles. So you are selectively reducing the amount of reference field, and as you can see in these equations, this is the total scattered uh, and reference field. So the contrast actually goes to infinite if you reduce the reference to zero. It's conventional dark field microscopy. You're not collecting any of the uh, you know, illuminating light. You're only looking at the scattered light. Yes, your contrast is infinite, but your signal is zero. Right? And there is some background. Signal is not exactly zero, but there is some noise background, so your signal disappears. So the image contrast is optimized by reducing the amount of reference. And we showed that we can get another 2x enhancement by putting that filter in. And we're able to demonstrate that for 25 nanometer radius polystyrene beads, we have actually 8% contrast. That's huge. More recently, we have not published these uh, results yet because we're waiting to get much better results but I thought it would be interesting from an optical engineering perspective. Don't ask me about these equations. I have no idea. This is basically Tikhono computational method to you know, combine images, something. So here, the idea is you don't have to limit yourself to a circular symmetric illumination field. You could block and rotate the four different co uh, coordinates, the illumination field. What that allows you is to actually double the effective numerical aperture and get super resolution images. We're working with Lei Tian. He just joined our department from Berkeley, um, and he's uh, an expert in computational imaging. So I'm going to show you some results. We had some samples made. You can't see it. Let me make it visible. So these are 80 nanometer wide silicon dioxide bars um, and about 500 nanometer long. These are fabricated on a silicon dioxide film. And this is basically the optical feature, right? If you had those features on a glass slide, you couldn't see them. Now we can see it when the image is in focus full NA illumination, that's what you can see. 
you do the uh, reconstructed image using the Tikhonov algorithms. I can't read the word, but I have no idea what it is. And instead of these uh, marks are showing the actual structure bare, you know, in there, and you can see it with much higher precision. I don't have to mark them anymore. And we went to from 50x to 100x, so we actually got a little better. And you can see that these 300 nanometer separation lines can be now resolved very clearly as the uh, cross sections show. I will tell you that these are really resolved. Um, we've done experiments with 200 nanometer separation, and we can resolve those. At 200 nanometers, at 532 nanometer wavelength, 0.6 lambda over NA, you can see this is beyond the diffraction limits. Now, the last topic I'm going to briefly talk about is single molecule detection. So in this case, we're not limited by the natural nanoparticles themselves. We can pick the labels ourselves. For that reason, we need, I mean, we pick gold. Because gold has visible resonance. We can make plasmonic resonant particles at the visible wavelength and then use that for detection of individual molecules after labeling them with gold nanoparticles. And mass labeling has been known for a long time for a variety of different detection algorithms. So in our case, we capture the target molecules and we decorate them with gold and count. Since we know what the gold should respond, we can easily filter out other things and count the number of uh, molecules on the surface. And that gives us sensitivity uh, less than one femtomolar. So typically, biosensing modalities that are commonly used have about 1,000 times or 10,000 times worse sensitivity. This level of sensitivity is uh, competing with what Quanterx can do using these uh, you know, micro wells and 240,000 different measurements simultaneously. But furthermore, since we can pick the nanoparticles, we don't have to pick symmetrical particles. The results I showed you were for spherical gold nanoparticles. We could pick rods. What happens with rods is, did the movie play? Right? If I change the rotate the polarization, the signal changes. Now it's much more distinguishable from the background, something that changes. Or you can apply a technique, what we call, as polarization dark field. You can basically illuminate with circular polarization <coughs> and pass it through another well plate and then analyze at a different angle. And instead of using the 50x objective, we can go down to a 10x objective. And the visibility is plenty sufficient to make the counting available at 10x. One thing you will notice is that these are two particles that are really bright, but they start merging together. The diffraction limit is growing, right? The particles appear to be larger in size, but they are not as bright. But the brightness is sufficient to count them here versus here. The background is a little grayer here because it's scaled. But nevertheless, you can count these very small gold nanoparticles. These are in the order of tens of nanometers in size. The smallest we use are 10 by 40. The, these, I think, are 20 by 70. It's important to use these small particles because you do not want to change the binding affinity of the attached molecules. If you were to attach a bowling ball, you're not going to capture that protein on the surface. right? Typically, people could use a micron-sized particle and see it, but that affects the binding affinity too much. At this size scale, it doesn't affect it as much, or at all. And the reason of using circular polarization, this is details, is that if you use linear polarizer, you miss a whole bunch of the particles because you get an uh, orientation angle when you have set your analyzer and um, uh, polarizer at a specific angle, you miss a whole bunch of them. But you use circular polarization and defocus, and you always get 
a point where they are bright. And then you get this interferometric signal, which is independent of the orientation of the nanoparticles. Because you can count them all. This way, we can do a true digital microarray readout just as well as it works for a commercial fluorescent scanner. This is showing that in 10 minutes, we can scan a very sparsely spotted 192 spots. You could have as many as 500 spots in the same field of view. It's actually eight different fields of view put together, and you can get a fluorescence readout-like output from this. These are all new, and hopefully we'll be able to get to the bottom of this. We're working on a manuscript. So it took us, give or take, 10 years to go from a tabletop with a tunable laser to a commercial instrument and incorporate the LEDs. We can make a very compact instrument, and it was actually commercialized. David and George started a company called NextGen. Now it's called NanoView. And they made an instrument that they can sell. And they have venture capital funding for exosome detection. And this is a burgeoning field with no other technologies that can come close to what they can do. I liken that to this Turkish cartoon. I think at Zoray, we were somewhere in between the square wheel and triangular wheel, it didn't roll well. I think next gen or NanoView is at this point. If you push it hard enough, it will roll. But I think with our recent developments, we are about to make this a good wheel. So it will cover the entire range of quality control, dynamic ensemble measurements, and single particle detection and characterization, and high throughput. I'm going to finish by showing you this one slide that we could also read it out on a, a cell phone. For In our case, it didn't make much sense because we still have this, some you know, substantial optics around it. But this was for NSF site visit of an ERC we had with you know, uh, uh, RPI. Um, they love to see something like this. We actually have our uh, associate dean for outreach and diversity go out to high schools and talk about iris technology and show them how it works. That's how simple it is. Yet, it took a concerted effort to get to this point with chemists, biologists, engineers, biomedical engineers, doctors, so on and so forth. And among these people, I have graduated who became professors, who became entrepreneurs, who became scientists in large research laboratories. And I have to admit that uh, three of them became actually patent lawyers, <laughs> right? I'm going to stop here, and uh, in the last 30 seconds, I'll take questions.